Mark Esper served as defense secretary for the final year and a half of former President Trump's time in office, certainly a tumultuous period that included Trump's first impeachment over Ukraine, the start of the global pandemic, and national unrest following the killing of George Floyd. Through it all, Esper had a front row seat as a member of Trump's cabinet, and he shares his views in his new book, A Sacred Oath, Memoirs of a Defense Secretary in Extraordinary Times. I spoke with him earlier today, and we began our conversation with the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine. I know that early on you kind of uh, questioned some of the Biden administration's tactics with handling Ukraine. At this point, uh, what do you think about the actions that they're taking? Well, I thought I thought the administration's actions initially were mixed. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I did not agree with taking the military option off the table. I thought it was a mistake to somehow describe an incursion, a minor one versus a major one. And I think we should have uh, supported the sale of MIGs or the provision of MIGs to Ukrainians. But at this point, it's much better, I think, the performance. They've managed to bring all the allies on board, which is critical in this regard. Uh, more material and munitions and weapons are flowing. So uh, I think they're doing far better. What do you see as the end game in this conflict? It's going to be up to Vladimir Putin. What, what does he define as success and can he define as success? As success? You know, clearly, phase one didn't work. He didn't capture Kiev and the other major cities. And at this point, it looks like he's going to try and uh, increase his gains in the Donbass and consolidate them. And then the question will be, can he move along to capture the southern coast and then up in, into Transnistria? And based on what we're seeing today, I don't see that he has the capability to do any of that. And it could drag on into years, mm. depending on what Putin settles on and how hard the Ukrainians fight. Let's talk about in the book where you really detail um, some specific incidents of uh, President Trump saying that it would be a good idea to maybe try to take out the drug cartels with mm -hmm. missiles in, in Mexico. Um, and then he said, well, just, you know, nobody has to know right. that, that it was us. Uh, another time where he's talking about using uh, U.S. military to actually shoot at the protesters in the mm -hmm. wake of, of George Floyd. As these moments were playing out, what's going through your mind? Well, look, on the Mexico case, his instinct was right to act about, about uh, taking action against drugs. But the notion of shooting missiles into a neighboring country, I started running through, okay, well, how do I talk him out of this and, and describe the fact that it would be illegal, it would be an act of war, it would be terrible for the relationship between our two countries and all these things. And then, of course, as I do in, with all the bosses I work for, propose some alternatives. Why don't we tackle it this way? Or why don't I go back and bring you some other options that make more sense? Was there a singular moment during your time where you came to the conclusion that President Trump is unfit? Or was this the culmination of, a, of events? The division happens over time, slowly. And then, uh, you know, the biggest moment is probably June 1st mm -hmm. in the Oval Office when the president is up and down out of his chair behind the, uh, behind the Resolute desk and he's, he's yelling, he's angry, he's swearing about the protests and, uh, and calling us all effing losers. And, uh, Including Vice President Pence. Yes, at one point he turns to Pence and, and says, you're, you're all effing losers, as he's looking at him and then continues to scan the room. And then we reach that moment where he sits back down in the chair and, and gazes right across the Resolute desk and looks right to General Milley and says, um, he goes, can't you just shoot him, just shoot him in the legs or something? And I think at that moment, we're all just dumbstruck, flabbergasted that, that this would be proposed, that the active duty military, and he was calling for 10,000 active duty troops to come into the city, and they would be the ones, presumably, that would shoot American protesters in the streets. And uh, we, we reached a new low at that point. You know, that's, that was kind of the moment, if you will. And right around that time frame was when you all end up following him over to Lafayette yeah. Square, the Bible, uh, that infamous moment at, at this point. How much of a mistake was that uh, for you to participate? It was a mistake. We get called back to the White House around 6.20 that evening to brief him on the events of, that, of, of what we were planning for the night. And that's when it turns into this, this show about going across to Lafayette Park. And, uh, you know, it didn't take us long while we were walking to, re to realize that we were duped. And it was a, a mistake. It was a big mistake. And uh, look, General Milley, to his credit, owned it. I owned it. Uh, I sent out a note the next day to all DOD, all the service members to say, look, remember, we are an apolitical institution. You have to live up to your oath. We have to respect and support Americans' rights to protest in the streets of America in the previous days with our troops. I believe that it was you and General Milley who had come up with the four no's, right? right? Um, explain the, the four no's and how close you felt like we got at, as a nation to to crossing one of those. Yeah, it's the, the, the four principles that would guide us for the remaining six months until the election. And so the four no's are uh, no misuse of the military, no politicization of DOD, no strategic retreats, and no unnecessary wars. And that becomes the metric by which I 
I judge day in, day out what is being proposed or coming through from the White House and to make sure that we didn't cross any of those very important lines. And, and just to go back for a moment, because mm -hmm. the, the former president has denied saying that he ever suggested that um, protesters uh, should be shot, and, and he went on to say, um, Mark Esper was a stiff who was desperate not to lose his job. He would do anything I wanted. That's why I called him Yesper. He says that you were simply a yes man. How do you respond to that? Well, unfortunately, my name doesn't rhyme with no. It rhymes, <laughs> uh, rhymes with yes. And as I said, look, if I'm, if I'm a yes man, I'm the worst yes man in history. So, look, it's, I think it's an emotional crutch by President uh, Trump because his ego can't take somebody saying no to him. That's my best theory. But look, uh, clearly we push back. At one point, you, you quote your wife in the book as saying, as your wife, please quit as an American citizen, please stay. Was there any time that you said, this isn't worth it? Oh, look, there were many days where I would come home and say, I, I can't do it. This is just, uh, it, it's not worth it. And she would say things like that to encourage me on. And I would talk to friends and I called predecessors, right? Former sect desks from both parties and talk to them. And Colin Powell became somebody I could lean on. And, to a man, they would say, you got to stay in there. you got to keep doing what you're doing. Don't make, make them fire you. And uh, that's kind of what kept me going on. There may be some critics who might say, but why blow the whistle now? Why write this book well after the fact when you could have really raised these big red flags in the moment at the time? Oh, yeah, sure. That's what I wrestled with. Do I stop now or do I, or do I keep going on? And my rationale and the advice I was getting from folks outside was stay because I thought I could do more for the country, more to keep things on track by being in that position, uh, by leaving. Because my big concern was not just leaving, uh, but who would come in behind me. And I was convinced that, uh, that, that the president would put uber loyalists in behind me. And I was very concerned about what would happen to the department. Of course, you were no longer serving at the time. You had been fired by the time yeah. January 6th happened. But how much of a real threat do you feel that that was to our democracy? Well, it was an insurrection. We haven't seen uh, an assault on the Capitol that hadn't happened since 1812 and, and an insurrection we hadn't seen since the Civil War. It was only a few thousand people. But what they were trying to do was uh, interrupt uh, the, the democratic process. You know, if there are two hallmarks of, of a democracy, one is the a fair and free election, and second is the peaceful transfer of power. And the president was contesting both of those and called people to the, to the nation's capital to protest, incited them to go to the Hill, and then failed to call them off. So, look, it was very serious, and we should take it seriously. And when we look at what's at stake here, what would you advise? You're still Republican, right? And, and people who are saying, hey, I would support uh, Donald Trump because I'm a Republican if he runs again in 2024. You've said, though, that, that he's unfit. What is, for, for people who are, you know, uh, torn because yeah. they have certain Republican values and beliefs, Look, I'm a Reagan Republican. That's uh, Ronald Reagan's one that inspired me to go West Point and, and join the military. And I would say this much. Donald Trump did advance a lot of core Republican uh, objectives, right? Lower taxes, deregulation, conservative judges on the courts, a stronger military. You can go down the line, right? Border security. Uh, but he did it with coarseness and divisiveness and things that kind of tore people apart and didn't grow the base. And I would say that we have a we have a new generation of Republican leaders out there who likely will run in 2024 who can deliver on those same core objectives, just like Donald Trump did, but without those other negatives. Our thanks to Mark Esper. A Sacred Oath, Memoirs of a Defense Secretary in Extraordinary Times is out today wherever books are sold. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.